No pressure. This is different. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you enjoy this kind of thing? No. <laughs> I'm absolutely terrified. So let's crack on. <laughs> well, uh, you know how we start this podcast. In your mind, what is high performance? I told you when you first try to get me to come on and do this, and it wasn't for this live show, it was for one of the recorded ones that I didn't have a clue. <laughs> so I gave a little bit of thought, uh, to come up high performance. The best I could come up with was a pathway to success, where probably the pathway is not really defined, so you have to find your own way down the path, and success is never defined either, because success, success is not always lifting up a big silver trophy. Success is, is measured in different, different types. So in football, for example, success when I went to West Brom was to keep them in the English Premier League. We did that successfully. The following season, when I had a little bad run, four games, sacked, welcome to football. Uh, that was my first managerial job. So, yeah, pathway to success. And you've, you've got to look for all the, the high performance along the way to try and get to that level of success that you want to have. So can we talk about the pathway where it started from, Steve? Because I know you grew up on, on the Ayrshire coast. And what your story fascinates is that you didn't get into football until relatively late. Would you tell us a bit about your journey before you got into football? No, no. I was, listen, I was always into football. In Scotland, it was, when I was growing up, it was, it was football or nothing. That's, that's what you did. Football or fighting, maybe. To, to steal a quote for Darrow. That, that's what we did. Uh, Came from a big family. Uh, my brother was a footballer, professionally. Uh, my young brother wasn't quite good enough to be professional, but had a decent footballing career. My father was a good amateur player. Got a really bad injury when he was young, so never made it to the, the top. He always wanted his boys to play football. Uh, but more than that, he wanted us to be successful, ambitious. And at that time, football didn't make any money. No money, so... When I left school, I was told to leave school at 16. Wasn't going to university, none of that. You're going to get a trade, son. So off to beat jumps, pharmaceuticals, to be an electrician. Didn't get in. Turned me down. <laughs> My dad was delighted with that. Uh, but they did offer me a, a position as an instrument artificer. But don't ask me what the second part means. You still don't know? I have no idea. <laughs> No idea. I, I call it instrument technician now. It's, it's basically what I trained as. So I trained for four years. 16, leaving school, going into a factory environment. You soon grow up quite quick. You know, you're working with a lot of wise old men who are always looking to take the, the piss out of the, the young apprentice. So you, you grow up quick. It was a good, was a good learning experience. Obviously, the football career picked up a little bit. I got picked up by St. Marno on schoolboy form and then provisional form, which is a sort of in-between before you become professional. Uh, I got farmed out to play in the, the Ayrshire Junior League, which also toughens you up. Uh, young boys, 16, 17, playing against seasoned, hardened criminals, I would call them. <laughs> <laughs> But I learned how to look after myself. Uh, and obviously, 18, I was offered a full-time contract, sorry, a part-time contract with St. Man. So, so what lessons did you learn, say, going into a factory at 16 or playing in that Ayrshire League that you were still applying when you did end up going to Chelsea and, and going on to play at, at, at sort of an elite level? I think you just, you just pick up the, the experience of all these people that you work with. They, 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 the factory is a different environment to a, to a football, to a football dressing room. It, it's totally different, but you get similar characters. They're there, they're always testing you, you're always being tested as a young person in there. Can you do this? Do you do that? They're always looking for you to make a mistake, to see how you react to the mistake. You get the ones who try and bully you, and then you have to stand up to them. You have to recognise that, that they're trying to bully you. Uh, you get the ones that will help you and look and go out their way to help you. I met a lot of good, really good people in the factory. Uh, unfortunately, most of the older ones have now passed on, which tells you how old I'm getting, which is, which is not so good. 
And then in the junior football, you, you you get similar lessons. You, you get the same idea. You get, you get people who look after you because they, they see your talent. They see you as a young person. I also had my uncle when I was playing in the junior leagues, played in the same team, looked after me. Uh, not physically because he wasn't quite as tough as me. Uh, but you, you just learn from these people and you, and you try to take those values in. I, I think all of them wanted you to be honest and straightforward. No... I think somebody, somebody said, mentioned, it was mentioned, somebody mentioned the word assholes earlier. These people just want to be normal. They just want you to be normal. They want you to go and do your work. Don't get above your station. And if you did get above your station, they knocked your head off. So it was a, it was a good way to, to grow up in a, a good learning environment for me. And how does that compare to the environment that you want to now create as a coach or you do create as a coach? Can you see the parallels between the two? particularly when it comes to... I like honesty, to the honesty. In, the, in, the, yeah. in the dressing room. I like honesty in the, the people that I work with, uh, right through from, from the staff, right through into the, the, the players. How do you foster that? Uh, I, th I think by example. You try and be as honest as you can be yourself. Sometimes uh, football management, it's not so easy to be completely honest, but you have to be as honest as you can be. Uh, can you explain that for us, why it's not easy? I think club management is, is different from the, the job I'm doing now, national team management, because you just borrow the players. So you borrow the players for, for the national team. They're not really your players. And it's a little bit easier. You bring them in, you ask them to, they're there to represent their country. They all want to be there. I, th I think that's one of the things that we've, we've managed to, to bring back into the, the national team. It's a little bit of pride to be picked for the national team and, and go and play for them now. When you're in a club environment, you have more time with them. You, you can work with them daily. You're there all the time. So you can drip feed those values in all the time. You can, you can, you can smell something in the dressing room. I, I, I don't know. It's, there's nothing written down. There's nothing written down in a bit of paper that says, look for this or look for that. You can just, with experience, you start to smell the situation. You think, okay, I need to have a word with those two players. They're constantly at each other and you're trying to get them before it becomes a fight on the training pitch. Sometimes it's the fight on the training pitch, and then you have to deal with that. But you, you try to preempt that. You try to read the situations. And then you're just asking them to respect each other. Uh, I think respect in football goes a long way. If, if your players within the squad respect each other, I think you've got a chance. The behaviour of, of honesty, though, fascinates me because when you talk about in a club environment, you've got young people now that are being richly rewarded at a young age that maybe don't share some of the values you learn in that factory or that football environment in Ayrshire. So you're dealing with people with big egos, maybe that get easily bruised. So how do you be honest with them, knowing that they've got an entourage behind them that might tell them the opposite? I think you just have to, you just have to lay it on the line. If you've got something to say to somebody, you're talking about honesty. If I've got something I want to say to somebody, I'm not going to, I'm not going to hedge my bets. I'm not going to soft soap it a little bit. I'm not going to hide from the issue. The issue has to be dealt with. So you have to deal with the issue. But you also have to understand that they're also human beings. So you don't want to, you don't want to upset them because you're going to need them. Maybe it's a player that you're leaving out of the team. You have to give them the, the reason why they're out of the team. You have to explain the reason why. They might not accept it, but they're more likely to accept it if you're honest with them. If you tell someone, I'm leaving you out because you didn't do, and I won't give specific examples, but you didn't do X, Y, and Z, so I'll leave you out of the team this week. And they'll argue, well, the guy you're putting in the team, he doesn't do X, Y, and Z either. I say, yeah, but he does X and Y better than you. And that's why he's playing next week. And they might not like that explanation because it's not clear to them, but they'll accept it because you've been honest. Hopefully. You have, you have such a limited time though with these players compared to their club managers. So what do you do to put into place the process to let them know as soon as they arrive with the Scotland team, what the culture is like, what the expectation levels are, what your standards are, because you don't have weeks and weeks and weeks to build these players up. You don't, but over a, over a number of camps, you start to 
you start to drip feed it in. It, 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 listen, it wasn't an easy start. We had Cyprus at home, was my first game. Cyprus at Hamden it was easy, we'll win that one. Last minute goal. Just made it. <laughs> and then after that, we backed it up with a, a game against Belgium, best team in the world. Then we went to Russia, Belgium, Russia, and we got absolutely scudded. <laughs> is, is, is the reality. And I'm looking at this group of players who'd been there before and they had a long period of failure, failure, failure. We didn't qualify for this, didn't do that. And you're thinking, I need to find a way to change the culture, the environment. How do I do it? Change personnel, some personnel. You, you, you don't have such a, a massive pool of players to pick from. So you have, you have to be selective. You have to decide what you want to do. We managed to pick up a little bit towards the end of that, that campaign. So the initial campaign came in 2000, summer 2019. Got hammered. Moscow 4-0 was probably the lowest point of my reign. And I started to question myself a little bit. And I'm thinking, what are we going to do? Thankfully, we had San Marino next game. <laughs> so I was pretty confident we'd get the win. And normally we just beat San Marino 2-0. We managed to beat them 6 which, which was a good night. And I came in the dressing room after that game and I was still devastated from the, the, the result in Moscow. M more the performance rather than the result because we got, we got 60 minutes into that game, 57, 58 minutes into that game. And we were in the game and we were competitive. We lost a goal from our set play. Within two minutes, we'd conceded another goal. And I'm not saying we chucked it, but we didn't do ourselves justice at the end of the game and we ended up losing 4-0. And that hurt me. And I told the players that that was unacceptable. It was, it's probably the only time where I've lost my temper with the, with, with the players because they're not your players and you don't want to upset them and you don't, want to, you don't want to have a go at them because it's difficult to repair that because you don't have the time that you have at a club. But I was angry and we managed to win the next game and I go away from that one and I'm thinking, okay, we've got two games, two games left, but I need to find a way to change this losing mentality where we just turn up, we get beat, we get knocked out, and we go to the next tournament and the manager gets sacked. I didn't want to get sacked. I wanted to hang around a little bit longer because I felt I had something to offer. We managed to win the next two games. Uh, we didn't play particularly well. We went to Cyprus, we won 2-1. It was a bit of a struggle, but it was a good result. And I actually bumped into Mick McCarthy not long after that. And Mick had good experience as an international manager. And he actually said to me, that was a great result in Cyprus because it's a bloody hard place to go and get a result. And that was good to hear. Somebody of, of the, same, the same ilk telling you that your team actually did well, even though you got criticised. Because we, at that time, we were getting criticised for everything, which is, which is fair enough, come to the job. Won the next game at home, 1-0 down at home to Kazakhstan. You can imagine we got cheered off the pitch at half-time. <laughs> <laughs> and we had another little chat in the dressing room at half-time, and I said to her, I said, listen, we're going to finish this campaign. It's not been a great campaign. Let's make sure we finish on a high. We went out second half a little bit better. We won the game 3-1. Great. Qualified for the, the playoffs. The playoffs were due to be in the March. Uh, obviously, COVID came in. But between the November and the March, I'd already started thinking, what are we going to do? What are we good at? Okay, we're not very good at this. Defensively, not great. We need to change. I phoned my coaches. We need to change. I said, we can't go back four. I want to go with a back three. I never coached a back three in my life. So, change for me, challenge for me. Challenge for my coaches. I think personnel, the personnel we had, we had probably two of the best left backs in world football, Tierney and Robertson. Got to get them both in the same team. It's not easy, two left backs. I didn't think we, at that moment, I didn't think the, the centre back options were great. So let's pick three. <laughs> Three is better we'll than see two. if that makes it better. Yeah. 
But my idea on the centre-backs was obviously to play Tierney as one of them and I had this mad idea that Scott McTominay could play the other one. And was just to change the shape of the team, I wanted to get Tierney and Robertson in the team. We were strong in midfield, I had good midfield players and I wanted to get at least three midfield players, possibly four into the team, which is how I started. I did fit four in. Nothing up front, really. Nothing great up front. We had one or two. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to knock the boys down. The boys that were turning up were doing everything they could to be, to be successful for us, but I needed to find a striker. Fortunately, I found an Australian one. <laughs> 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 so I knew that, I knew that Lyndon was, was available to come. Uh, so I managed to have a conversation with Lyndon that persuaded him to come. I had a really good conversation with Kieran Tierney to tell him that he was going to be the best left centre-back Scotland had ever had. <laughs> can, you, can you give us a bit of insight into how that conversation went? Because this is always interesting. For people here that don't work in football, it's about what can they learn for bringing people on the journey with them? How did you get Kieran on the journey? Kieran had always... Or, or, sorry, Kieran had a sort of myth had built up around Kieran that he didn't want to come and play with the national team, which wasn't correct. He was being asked to come and he played, he played in Gordon's team and he played as a right back. He's obviously a left back. Uh, and being a, a full back myself, I know how difficult it can be to, to switch from side to side. Kieran could do a, a really good job on the right, which he did do, he was doing well. But I think he always felt that he was a better left back than Andy Robertson, which every player always thinks are better than the, the immediate competition. And if you look at the two of them, there's, the, there's not a cigarette paper between them. They're, they're both fantastic players. So my job on, on, on that one was to persuade Kieran that he was better than Andy. And that's why I trusted Kieran to play less centre-back and not Andy. Now, that's not, it's probably not strictly true. <laughs> but I had to sell it to Kieran. This is, this is, what, this is, this is where I see you playing. And I'm not telling you you're a defensive centre-back. Now, we've got the best overlapping left centre-back in world football, probably, because Kieran just goes. And I'm standing on the side bench going, Kieran, where are you going? <laughs> but it works. It works. It works well. So, so was to sell that position to Kieran was important. And it was a, it was a really good conversation. He asked a lot of really good questions. But I told him I loved him and I wanted him to play there. And I told him that when he came back and joined, because he, had, he hadn't been in a, a number of camps he'd missed, he'd been injured. He was going to come to the November camps and he, 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 he had an operation or a little procedure on his shoulder. So I, I'd never had Kieran in the squad, so that was, that was a big, big part of, of moving the team forward. And, and the conversation with Lyndon Dykes was quite straightforward. I said to Lyndon, Listen, I don't know if you feel Scottish or Australian. I said, only you can decide. I said, I'm telling you, this is what we have in the national team. This is what's in front of you. This, this is your competition. But you have to decide if you want to play for Scotland or you want to play for Australia because I can't, I can't see inside your, in your mind, I can't see inside your body how you feel. And he, he phoned me back and he said, no, nah, I'm Scottish. My, uh, my wife's Scottish. My daughter's Scottish and I want to play for the national team, and I think everyone will agree he's, he's done quite well for us. Yes, brilliant. But, but, but it's two different conversations. Yeah. So it's, it's a conversation where you're trying to sell a position to someone, and the other conversation is, you know you want to say to Dykes, Dykes, you know you're Scottish, come on. <laughs> but you have to let them make the decision. It's two different conversations. Steve, can I take you back to a period of time where you described briefly that game in Moscow? Because I think everybody here has had their own share of failures or setbacks or disappointments. And I'm intrigued as, what sort of questions were you asking yourself to process that frustration you felt to be able to then put yourself in a position of coming at it and embracing change and doing something different? Preparation. What was I doing, what was I doing wrong? I blame myself. I was, picking the, I was picking the squad, I was picking the team, I was picking the tactics. And I'm saying, I'm doing something wrong. Right. And I couldn't quite work out what it was. 
but you're looking at it and then you, you get that little period. It's, it's not a little period, it's a long period from the end of November to March. It's a long time to, to sit and think. And it was, we need to reset. And the reset was to change the formation, was to change the system. And was also to change the way that I worked with the teams because I was trying to fit in how I worked at a club. You have your own method, you have your own procedures, how you work through the week. And you, you try and put in certain training elements across. And I was trying to put this into the, the national team boys, but I was only getting maybe one decent training session. So the national team is, they play at the weekend with a club. They come, they recover for two days. You might get a day's training and then you're playing a match. You might get two days training if you're really lucky. So you weren't getting a lot of time on the training pitch and I was trying to, I think I was trying to squeeze too much in in terms of uh, the training, the way that I'd worked at a club. And I thought, I've got to simplify this. I've got to just break it down and say, look, there's your tactic, there's your recovery, there's your tactics, there's your team meeting, there's the game. Did it work straight away? Probably not. Was the, by the time we played again was September. We, we drew 1-1 at home to Israel. This was the first time we tried the system. Wasn't very good. If I'm being honest, it wasn't very good. Uh, we played Czech Republic away, but it was a Czech Republic league select because they, they'd been ravaged by, with COVID. And obviously... The Scottish media thought we should go there and win 6-7-0. Uh, we didn't. We, we managed to beat them. 2-1. Lucky, hanging on at the end, and really hanging on at the end. And we came in after that game and everybody was sitting in the dressing room like... like that. And I'm saying, guys, we, we won the game. And the character that they showed in the last 10 minutes, making saves, blocking shots, getting back to cover for their mate, everybody dying to make sure we got that result. I said, that's how you build a team. And the captain was on the same page, Andy. Andy Robertson was on the same page. That's how you build a team performance. And then I spoke to some of the senior boys about the system because I wasn't convinced. I wasn't convinced that, that, that they were buying into it. And every one of them told me, now we like it. We feel good. It's the most comfortable we've felt on the pitch for a long time. We think it'll work. Brilliant. And we stuck with it. But that was a conversation between myself and a lot of the, the more senior players in the group because I had to make sure that the players were buying into it. It was their identity. And now that's their team system and that's their shape. And, and I think the, the little bit of success we've had grew from there. So, I mean, what you're describing there is, we've seen it in the 103 episodes when we spoke to other guests, of, they often talk about this idea of success leaves clues. They look at what they can do, they catch each other in, rather than look at what they can't do and catch each other out. How, how common have you found that in your coaching career, both in club and international career, that you get praised for what you can do rather than the focus tends to be on what you're not able to do? I think it's very important to, to focus on what you can do rather than what you can't do. It, it's one of the, the bugbears I've got with people that scout. So you get your scouts and you send them out, and the first thing they do when they come back is, he's got no left foot, can he run, he's lazy. I say, yeah, but what's he good at? They never tell you, they always tell you what he can't do first. It's most important that you find out what they can do. And then if what they can do fits into your team or your way of thinking, then you should bring them to the club and then you can work on what they can't do. And talking about what a player can do, away from being a footballer, I'm really interested to know what the likes of uh, a Robertson or a McGinn brings to that Scotland dressing room. Not just as great footballers, but what do they bring as people? Personality. Special McGinn. <laughs> Personality. Uh, but they, they, they bring a... I, th I think the boys who play in the English Premier League, they bring an assuredness to the squad, a confidence. Andy Robertson's won the Champions League. He's been club world champion. He brings an assuredness to the, to the squad. Kieran Tierney's down there playing now. Scott McTominay's not shy of confidence. Plays at Man United. You see his performances every week. He's on that pitch. He, he puffs out his chest. And they bring an assuredness to the squad that 
everyone else buys into. You've got the captain of Celtic, you've got a future captain of Arsenal, you've got the cap, uh, captain Andy playing at Liverpool, you've got McTominay could be a captain at Man United, you've got McGinn could be a captain anywhere. So you, you've got leaders, you've got the captain of Celtic, you've got people like Grant Hanley, captain of Norwich, as you well know. So we've got so many good people in the squad and I, I think that has also been a process of trying to get good people in, trying to sell the idea that we can be successful. We can be successful. You've got to get that over well, to them. Yes, <laughs> come on, you've got to believe. But this is like, see, I think that reaction though, even that reaction is really interesting because I think if you're in... London and Gareth Southgate says, yeah, we can be successful straight away. Everyone's like, yes, we can be successful. Here, there's still a hesitancy. There's still a, oh, okay, maybe. Like, it seems that it's still a process unpicking all of those previous years, as you describe, trying to qualify, not qualifying, sacking the manager, then doing it again and repeating. And there was always great players. Scotland's always had great players. I'd love to know, psychologically... A, how deep-rooted was that mindset of, well, we don't qualify, we just play qualifying matches? And how, whether you underestimated, actually, how deep that went and how hard you had to work to recover from it? I definitely underestimated it. And it's not till you go in and, and you, you suffer that first run of games to realise there is a problem here. And it was something we had to shake. But we shook it in the, the, probably the most Scottish way that you could. Because in the playoff final against Serbia, I thought we were magnificent for 90 minutes and then in injury time. So you're 1 0 up and you're thinking, one more corner. Come on, lads, just defend it. <laughs> nah, nah, we'll concede the goal. So we'll go 1 1 and you're thinking, oh my God, here we go again. Scotland, glorious failures. Because the performance from, from the first minute to the 90th minute before we conceded. I thought was as good as anything that, that I'd seen in a, a long time for a Scottish team going away to a, a difficult opponent in Serbia. And you're on the sideline and you're thinking, oh no, surely not again, surely. Because I don't think we could have recovered for the hurt of that if we hadn't, if we hadn't qualified. I certainly couldn't have recovered for the hurt of that because I knew how close we were and how well we'd played. And then you go for that. And I remember saying to them, the last thing I said to them before that, and it was true for 90 minutes of the game. I said, listen, lads, there's only one, I think there was a room, there was about 36 people in the room. 36, no, there was about 28 people in the room. I said, there's only one person in this room who's ever been to a major final with his country. I said, unfortunately, it's not Scottish. <laughs> it was Stephen Reid, who'd been there at the World Cup with Ireland as a player. I said, this is your chance to go and do it. I said, but don't burden yourself with what's happened before because we cannot affect what's happened before. And the last thing I said to them was, don't play with the fear of failure. Try to play with the anticipation of success. And I think we did that up until that, <laughs> up until that goal. <laughs> and then after that, we just hung on and we clung on, but. Obviously, you can see the goal in the last minute. One one, you come together, the group. And I was worried for them. And then you start to hear the voices, your Robertsons. Your McGinn was off the pitch at the time, but in the group around Kenny McLean, Ryan Jack, Callum McGregor. And there was a determination. As we're not out, we're still in the competition. We've still got a chance to go through. Let's make sure next 30 minutes we give everything on the pitch and we get there. Okay, we had to go to penalties, it was a bit nerve-wracking, but that desire was still there. So as a coach, I'm thinking, we're all right. I didn't need to say too much. Really? They did it. They were, we've come so far. Don't mess it up now, guys. But how did you learn to step out of your own way there? Because I can imagine at that moment, there's a danger of your ego kicking in of, I need to come in and deliver a great speech and get them fired up. And yet you've described that you actually stepped out of the way. I didn't need to, I didn't need to be there. You, you, you know your group, you know your players, you know what they're thinking. You know the journey they've been on and you know how determined they were to be successful. 
And it didn't need a big speech. It was keep it simple, keep the bases, don't make mistakes, stay in the game. And we did that. We had to weather a little storm in the first half of extra time. And then the rest of it was, was reasonably comfortable up until the penalties. And then after that, it's, it's fortunate that we're quite good at taking penalties. So when we, were, when we were talking in the first half an hour and we mentioned world-class basics, did that ring a bell with you? I think if you get the basics right, you've got the foundation to do anything you want. So I'd never thought about world-class basics, but I think football's a really simple game. And if you do get the basics right and you've got good talent, then you have a chance to be successful. But if you don't get the basics right, everything falls apart. So in terms of world-class basics, yeah, I suppose it comes down to the sort of perfect practice makes perfect. Not practice makes perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. So it comes down to a, a similar sound bite to that. I'm not big in sound bites. I'm not big in things like that. But that was what I was always told was perfect practice makes perfect, which is similar to World Cup basics. Now, you've coached alongside some some quite stellar names, whether it's Ruud Hullet or you worked with Mourinho uh, in his first spell at Bobby Chelsea. Robson, Sir Bobby Robson. Sir Bobby Robson. Kenny. So tell us then, Kenny. what was yeah. the consistent, what was the consistent um, traits that you saw in those guys that, that we could learn from? All different people, uh, all different characters. Probably too many traits to, to go through them all. Uh, the top three? Top three, Mourinho organisation, uh, attention to detail, Kenny man management, Bobby Robson man management, for sure, was, was probably one of the best in terms of man management. Bobby, not, not someone you'd look at his coaching sessions and go, wow, I want to copy that. But when he spoke to a player and you were in the room and you listened to him, you got emotional or you got excited for the player that he was talking to. Can you remember a time when you sat there and heard a conversation and thought, this is, this is amazing, this is something that I need to learn from? Yeah. Early with Bobby was obviously Rude had been at Newcastle just over a year. Uh, it didn't work out. He persuaded me to leave my, my London home, move up to the northeast, uprooted my family, took them all up, and then one year later he, he was scribbling a, a note after a game. So what are you doing, lovely boy? Which is what everybody called lovely boy. I'm just writing a writing a note. It was his resignation, but he didn't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Woke up the next morning, he left. Uh, Thanks, Rude. And a lot of his issues up there had stemmed for the fact that him and Alan Shearer, two big egos, didn't quite get on. Uh, best of mates now, by the way. They're, they're both work in the media and they love each other. But at that time, nothing was every day. Every day was, was difficult. So we didn't get the best out of Alan. Rude couldn't get the best out of him. And Bobby came in. And I remember Bobby said, I'm going to have a chat with Alan tonight, son. It was before we played... We were actually back at Chelsea. So we were at Chelsea Harbour Hotel. Was, I want you to come and sit in with me, with me and Alan. And he brought Alan into the room. And honest to God, he made the guy feel 10 feet tall. I felt 10 feet tall for Alan. It was, <laughs> it was unbelievable. You, you're going to be the main man. You are the main man. Hasn't worked out for you. You're a goal scorer, son. You're going to be the lead the line. You're number nine at Newcastle. He went through all Jackie Melba and all the, all the great number nines that played at Newcastle. You are the man. Out the next day, lost 1-0 at Chelsea. <laughs> Never scored. Hardly got a kick. Chelsea were, Chelsea were better than us. I thought, oh. Next week, home to Sheffield Wednesday, 8-0. Shearer, four goals. And from there, Shearer was back. And I was just on the, on the back of one really good conversation from somebody who knew how to massage an ego and make someone feel good about themselves again and make someone feel really important. And that was a big lesson. So here's a question then. You work with all these amazing colleagues, the Hullets and the Zolas and the, the Bobbies and, and everything. You have this brilliant stellar football career at a time when it's not easy to uproot and head to London and play over 400 games for Chelsea. And then in your management career, you've had 
what was that time the, the best ever finish in the Premier League for West Brom, eighth in the Premier League. You were at Reading and Fulham came calling. You then came up to Scotland and you were doing brilliant in club management. You take over the national team, you take them to a tournament, you change the mentality of Scottish football. And we want, obviously, total honesty on this stage because this is what this is about. Do you feel you get the credit you deserve for the management career that you've had? I'm not sure I changed the mentality of Scottish football. It wasn't me. I think you helped. It was my team. It was the team on the pitch. The, the players, the, the, the supporters engage with the players. Not me, I'm very difficult to engage with. <laughs> <laughs> but the question remains. <laughs> Do you think you get the credit that you deserve? I don't look for credit. It, it, it doesn't bother me. And people look at you and say, listen, everybody likes to be loved. Everybody likes to be appreciated. But if the credit doesn't come, it doesn't come. I can live with that. As long as I know, I can go to my bed every night and say, I'm doing the right job. I'm trying to do the right things. I'm trying to be good at what I do. And I've got the love and support of my family. That's enough for me. Lovely. But notwithstanding all of that, <laughs> I look at, you know, a really good example, I think, of where many of us would choose not to be football managers is that amazing eighth place in the Premier League for West Brom and fired four months later. Do you not allow ever a sense of injustice to build up or do you have to learn to accept that that is the life of a manager? That was my first second. Uh, and they say you're not really a manager till you get sacked. So I was a manager after that. But I'd also prepared really well. I was told, when I was coming towards the end of my playing career, and I played in a time where we didn't finish, we, didn't finish, we spoke about this backstage, you didn't finish as a millionaire. You didn't finish with loads of money. You just had a good living wage. If you saved a little bit, you could have a nice little pension. You were going to have to go and get another job. I was fortunate that I managed to stay in football. And then from there, you... You build yourself a career. And you... Sorry, I've lost my track. You need to come back to me. West Brom. West Brom. You weren't a manager until you lost it. Did I feel... I felt a little bit aggrieved that I'd lost my job at West Brom. Did I deserve to lose my job? Probably not. I'm very good at parking things. So I went home. I remember the night I got sacked, we... Malky's in the room somewhere, I think, as well. Malky beat, Malky beat his one. Malky was at Cardiff. We went to Cardiff, uh, lost 1-0. It was a sh not a very good game. Missed a big chance in the last minute to get a 1-1. And you're driving back in the bus to the training ground. Uh, no phone call for the director of football. No phone call for the chairman. No, no phone call from anybody. You're driving back and you think... They're obviously not very happy with me. You drive into the training ground and you see the, the light on in the chairman's office and you just go, bye-bye, bye. <laughs> see you, lads. <laughs> what, can you reveal to us what the kind of conversation is like in that situation? Because we read all the time managers getting jobs and managers losing their jobs. None of us really know how, how does that process work? What actually happens? Obviously got summoned into the chairman's office. Was the chairman was... Uh, I can't remember what his title was, Richard Garlick, who had taken over from Dan Ashworth as sort of football's, football director or whatever. Not as good as Dan. <laughs> the finance guy, one other director, and me. And obviously you know you're going in, you know you're going in to get canned. So you walk in, have a seat, shake hands all the way, Chairman says, Richard, this will be your, this will be yours. So it was Richard Garlick for second. I actually felt sorry for him. So I'm sitting there getting sacked, and he's bumbling his way through. Well, you need to make a change, and results are not being that good. And he's gone red, and he's starting to sweat. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, I'm getting really uncomfortable. Going, Richard, are you all right? <laughs> <laughs> and that was my first experience. The chairman didn't say anything. He didn't say anything. Then we got, we got sort of 
two, three minutes into the conversation, I said, listen, there's a termination clause. Uh, I know you're going to put me in garden and leave. Thanks very much. Uh, and I just went home, took my club tie off, fruit in the fire. And that was it. Really? Part. No attempt to fight your corner, make your case, to change their minds, nothing. You can't change their mind. If, if they don't want you, they don't want you. And you, you could probably try and change their mind and they'll sack you the following week because you lose again. So it's better just to go and just get out. So can we ask from a different angle then about, because you obviously interview well to get jobs. So we've spoken about when you've lost the job. Will you tell us about the process of how you convince the chairman or the owner of a club or director of football, like you described Richard, to buy into your vision and to entrust you with the keys to that dressing room? It was Dan Ashworth I had to sell myself at West Brom. The, now, the, the, the process is quite simple. You, you just sit down and you, you be yourself. I don't do presentations. I just sit down, I tell them what my ideas are, what I think I can bring to their football club, and then I let them choose. And I haven't had that many managerial jobs. I mean, it was, was West Brom, I was Reading for a year. I lost the job at Reading because I made a mistake of speaking to Fulham and then staying at Reading. Don't know why I did that. But things happen for a reason. Yeah. And then I had the job at Kilmarnock, which went very well. And then I've, I've had the national team job. So I haven't had, I haven't had too many But in an interviews. age where you hear about managers sort of coming up with really slick PowerPoint presentations and being able to speak the lingo of, uh, the, sort of, of the values of a club and things like that, for you to be almost anachronistic by just coming in and being yourself. Do you feel that that puts you at a disadvantage? No. I think if you can sell yourself, you've got a better chance than some flashy presentation that somebody else has prepared and you're presenting. Because not very many managers who prepare their own presentation. They'll be given a presentation by somebody in the analysis analysis department for the last club they were at or they'll carry this presentation and all they'll do is they'll, they'll take the name off the top <laughs> change the colours and they'll put in a different club and they'll go there you go there's my next presentation so Alex Ferguson you better just to go and be yourself and yeah. say this is me if you want me to do the job I can do the job if you don't want me to do the job thanks very much I'll try somewhere else so Sir Alex Ferguson had famously advised coaches that don't pick the club pick the owner so how do you? So when you're going into these meetings and you're being yourself, how do you determine whether the owner is somebody that you're going to work with? Don't go to Reading. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was that was something that you learn. Uh, I went to the first one. Obviously, I spoke to Dan a lot. I knew the chairman, Jeremy, Jeremy Peace, uh, good man, uh, but brutal when it came to decisions. But ran a good ship. I knew it was a stable club, uh, British owned. Roy had been in before me, Roy Hodgson, done a great job. So I knew it was, uh, I was quite fortunate with the West Brom job because Roy obviously had been headhunted to take the, the English national team job, which meant that I wasn't going into a struggling team. I was going into a team that had been pretty successful and, and was quite stable. And we managed to tweak it a little bit and do well. You got to Reading and the Reading job was, was surreal how I got it because I was lying on the beach and and I don't lie on the beach very often, I'm for, I'm for Ayrshire. <laughs> I was lying on the beach in the Caribbean somewhere, me and my wife, just before Christmas. We decided to get away because I was out of work. I thought I'd catch a bit of sun. I got a phone call from an agent, uh, quite a well-known agent. He said, do you want the, the Reading job? I said, no, no, Nigel, Nigel Adkins is there. Uh, I'm not going to speak to anybody when there's a manager in position. He won't be in that position tomorrow was what I was told. I said, okay, uh, I'm in the Caribbean, I'll be back. I think this was, in the, this was on the Saturday that Reading had just lost 6-0 at, six at Birmingham. Not back to Wednesday. No, no, that's not good enough. The job's yours if you want it. You need to be back Monday. I should have thought about it a little bit more. But I jumped on the plane, got back, did the deal, took the job. Got in a couple of weeks in, I'm thinking, Ooh, should have done a little bit more due diligence on this one. <laughs> but it lasted a year. And we got to the FA Cup semi-final, which was 
quite only the second time Reading had ever been there in, in their, their history. So that was, that was a little achievement. When you say small measures of success, that was a small measure of success. It was a great measure. And now it brings us up to the current day. And you've got the small matter of a couple of playoff games coming up. Yeah, can't wait. It's been a long break. <laughs> tell us on the crowd, but tell us how you're feeling then ahead of, ahead of these two. That's good. Obviously, we finished the, the group stage very well. Six, six consecutive wins is, is tough to do. Uh, two great nights at Hamden with a close, close call against Israel. We managed to nick a goal in the last minute and obviously the, the, the game against Denmark was, was a fantastic performance and a good night and great for everyone. And, and you just feel there's a little positivity around with a... The following, the, the supporters of Tartan Army are getting excited, which is great because I know the players are excited for it. The players are looking forward to it. It's, it's going to be a tough game. Ukraine is, is a good team, really well organised. If I said that you look at the, the four teams, ourselves, Ukraine, Wales, Austria, for me is, is a 25% chance for everybody. We'll go there, we'll give our best and hopefully our best will be good enough. Just, um, we won't share this with anyone else, obviously. Would you just give us a, an insight into what your message will be for those players ahead of that, that period? Because it's about being up for it, but not being so up for it that emotion takes over and it negatively impacts the performance. I think the biggest thing with, with playoff games, and fortunately, we've got some recent experience because we had, we had the playoffs for the, for the Euro 20, 2020. We had to play first game at Hamden, both games behind closed doors, which is totally different. But first game at Hamden against Israel, I don't know if anybody here remembers the game that much because it wasn't very memorable. It was a horrible game, it was a horrible night. It was two teams afraid to lose. And we sneaked through on, on penalties. Did we deserve to, to win the game in 90 minutes? Probably not. Did we deserve to win it in extra time? Probably not. Because there was nothing between the two Two teams, there's nothing in the game. And you get that a lot in semi-finals, if you like. You, you call the, the first playoff games are semi-finals. You get it a lot where the nerves overtake the, the ability to perform to the maximum. So for me, again, it's a little bit like the Serbia game. Please, whatever you do, lads, when you go out in front of the show house at Hamden, the Tartan Army, they're there, they're there to support you. Go and play. Don't freeze. And I think if we do that, we can get through the first game. And then you have to go away, Wales or Russia. Bring it on. Brilliant. Bring it on. Uh, listen, we've had lots of questions in for you. So let's have a couple, of, uh, a couple of questions from the audience. And thank you all very much for your many questions. Um, and we'll just... Nice short answer, Steve. We'll just run through two or three of these if we can. Steve, what was the biggest challenge when building a team? Evening, Rob. Club football is... a. Uh, Getting players, getting the right players. So your, your scouting system, uh, I think probably the most important department in a, any football club is your, is your scouting department because if you get good players, you've always got a chance. Uh, in the national team, I think just to... I've, I've probably talked through that process enough with the national team and how we, we shaped it and we, we changed and we tried to give this certain team, this group, uh, an identity and a way to play, which is probably different for, for what what they had done previously and it's been relatively successful. Can I ask a follow-up question on that, Steve? Like, if you had to give a percentage of, so when, you, like when you're making a judgment of bringing somebody into the squad, how much of it is based on their talent as a footballer and how much of it is on the personality and the characteristics as a person? Probably 90%, 10%. 90% of the person? 90% the talent. Is it? See, so other managers we've spoken to have said they would take the person over the ability, attitude over ability. You want the best players? Sometimes you've got to take some rascals to get the best ones. <laughs> nice. And, and then, have you have, then you have to deal with the rascals. <laughs> yes. That's a whole other conversation. Let's have another quick question from uh, someone in the room. Jamie says, being the manager of the national team, have you ever had a feeling of imposter syndrome? And if so, how did you overcome it? Good question. No. <laughs> <laughs> and a good answer. Uh, last question then from the, uh, from the crowd here this evening. Brett, 
I'm taking a team of 10-year-olds through to Murray Park to play against the Rangers Academy team tomorrow. What would your team talk be? <laughs> play your best. Play your best. Be organised. Enjoy yourself. Play your best. There you go. Those will be the final words ahead of the, uh, ahead of the playoff games, I'm sure. What an interesting conversation. And it's so rare to hear a current manager talk so candidly and so honestly about the challenges in front of them and the future and the past. And um, it's been an absolute pleasure. So thank you very much for giving up your evening in front of the crowd. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your manager, Steve Clark. Please hit subscribe hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community. Thanks for being part of the adventure.